continue to file in, so we're going to get started here. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our honoring, healing, and remembering. This afternoon, we'd like to thank a few individuals before we continue to our afternoon portion of the program. Let's give a big round of applause to our behavioral health staff that grilled and supplied our delicious lunch today, as well as the Sword Eagle Casino and Resorts. Chief McGwatch for standing behind the grill on this beautiful afternoon. Tough gig to get out of the office there, guys. But uh, we appreciate you coming out. Also, a big thank you to some of those supporters uh, for the monetary donations to help make this possible. A uh, big thank you to the Gun Lake Tribal Council for their monetary donation, as well as the uh, Nanoiseppe here on Band Potawatomi Ogichidao, Pokagan Band of Potawatomi Ogichidao Society, as well as the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi Tribal Council. Round of applause for them once again for helping us with today's events. I know we may have some folks continue to file in. We asked while we have our speakers up here that we kind of keep the noise to a minimum here inside the tent. So we make sure that we're giving proper respect to our speakers this afternoon. First keynote address this afternoon, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce William Johnson. He is our z -Wing Curator and Interim Historic, Tribal Historical Preservation Officer for the Saginaw Triple, Chippewa Indian Tribe. Can you please help me welcome Willie Johnson. some ancient uh, Anishinaabe artifacts today for everyone to enjoy. Um, if you take a look down uh, in the little chair here, we have a nine-year-old t-shirt. Uh, this is my t-shirt from my, uh, my closet. And uh, if, we, if we take a look at that lovely little t-shirt, uh, it's from the uh, White Bison Well Variety Journey for Forgiveness. And uh, we, we did that in 2009. And um, uh, not too long ago, about a good week ago, uh, someone visited the Zebra Wing Center with that very t-shirt on. And in my uh, inimitable Forrest Gump impersonation, I said, hey, I know that t-shirt. And it's a beautiful t-shirt. So. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do was to start out with um, how we got this whole train of rolling uh, in regard to the honoring, healing, and remembering event that we host, uh, which, by the way, we have hosted since 2011. So uh, another thing that I had an opportunity to bring out today, um, our ancient artifacts, is we uh, have these lovely lanyards that we get every year. So here's my here's my 2018 honoring, healing, and remembering event staff lanyard. And hanging on the boarding school guitars, we have 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, and guess where 2018 is going to go? Right, right after this this little event, so um, I'm very pleased that uh, you know we've been doing this for so long. So on June the 8th of 2009, the Saginaw Chippewa Tribal Council uh, duly adopted a resolution, and I'd like to read a little uh, uh, of that resolution to you because it means so much to us as we honor the White Bison Incorporated's well Briety journey for forgiveness. And if you bear with me. On May the 16th of 2009, White Bison Incorporated, an American Indian nonprofit charitable organization, began a 40-day, 6,800-mile cross-country journey to present and former American Indian boarding school sites 
with the goal of promoting awareness, dialogue, and forgiveness among Native peoples for the historical trauma of the Indian boarding school era, which began uh, right here in the United States of America in 1879. The Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School operated in Mount Pleasant, Michigan from 1893 to 1934. The school opened with 59 students, nine grades, beginning with kindergarten. And by 1911, there were 11 buildings and annual enrollment grew to 300 students. And as you see, we have seven of the historical uh, buildings still left standing. And many of you went on a tour uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Unresolved grief among school survivors and or their descendants may still be carried from trauma experienced at these schools. An increasing body of evidence shows that intergenerational trauma is connected to suicides, substance abuse, domestic violence, child sexual abuse, family breakups, and diabetes, which continue to plague American Indian communities today. And the Wellbriety well Journey for Forgiveness uh, assisted us to, to begin the healing process in American Indian communities across the country. Between 1879 to 1934, American Indian children were forcibly removed from their homes to attend one of 500 schools run by the U.S. federal government and churches to assimilate the American Indian people. And as we know, at these schools, children were severely punished for speaking their native languages and practicing their traditions and their cultural ways. Widespread physical and sexual abuse against children occurred at the schools and, and has been widely documented. Many died there, and it's unfortunate that their bodies remained in marked and unmarked graves. And that's why it's so important that the Zeboing Center's uh, research center staff worked so hard to document those students that perished while they were attending the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School. So, for those of us that may remember, on June the 11th of 2008, the Canadian government apologized to First Nations people for the thousands who were traumatized at the schools. And at the time this was being written and, and, and adopted in 2009, there was a bill that was currently in the US Congress to apologize for what happened at the Indian boarding schools uh, in the United States. But um, uh, if someone could help me, we, that, that apology isn't official, right? Shannon Martin, our Z-Wing Center director, is shaking her head, so. The U.S. federal government hasn't apologized for the atrocities that have happened uh, in the boarding schools. So on June the 17th of 2009, in conjunction with the White Bison's 2009 Wilbriety Journey for Forgiveness, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan hosted the, uh, the journey with the sunrise ceremony at the Tribal Operations Building. And uh, we had a Three Fires Confederacy walk uh, we walked all the way to the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School, and um, we also had a, a, a day of guest speakers and some panel discussions. We had a healing ceremony and a jingle dress healing dance. We had a hundred drums, honor song, and a healing the circle concert. So I wanted to begin the day uh, today uh, by remembering White Bison, uh, and all the efforts that they did on behalf of all the students that attended all the schools throughout the United States of America. All right. 
so many of us have heard today uh, the wonderful contributions from the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. Where's the Pokagon Band out there? You can, you can shout, Pokagon Woo! Band of Potawatomi Indians. All right. And the Nottawasepi Huron Band of the Potawatomi Indians. Where are you? All right. So um, Shannon Martin, our, our director at the Zeboing Center, uh, she re received some emails. And I want to read the, uh, these emails to you real quick. And this was an email from the Gun Lake Tribal Council. It said, Miigwech for reaching out to the Gun Lake Tribe to assist in the support of honoring, healing, and remembering. And we are proud to be considered such a great resource for causes such as yours. So let's give Pokagon Band of Pot oh, excuse me, Machibinashewish Band of Potawatomi, the Gun Lake Tribe, a round of applause because their support means so much to it. All right, almost goofed that up. So uh, Shannon also received a, a thank you from Tribal Councilwoman Judy Winchester from the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians, and this is what she said. She said, I'm happy we can contribute. What you guys do is very important, and I hope that perhaps it can be an agenda item at the Michigan Uni United Tribes for everyone to help out. So let's give a round of applause to our Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. on a roll now. And this is where we put you to sleep. Because we get to talk about historic preservation. It's our favorite subject. All right, this is what we do. Um, and there are other tribal historic preservation officers um, throughout the great state of Michigan and our Anishinaabe tribes. Let's see, the Bay Mills Indian Community has a tribal historic preservation office. Bay Mills Indian Community. Show some love for them. They do a lot of hard work. Uh, let's see, who's next? I'm doing this all by memory. Um, Machi Benesiwish Band of Potawatomi, the Gun Lake Tribe, uh, is soon to assume their responsibilities on behalf of the state in regard to historic preservation. So let's hear it for the Machi Benesiwish Band of Potawatomi. The Nottawasepi Huron Band of the Potawatomi has a, a tribal historic preservation officer. Nottawasepi. <laughs> Keweenaw Bay Indian Community has a tribal historic preservation officer. His name is Mr. Gary F. Yoonsfoot Jr. Does a lot of good work. Let's see, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians has a tribal historic preservation officer. They work really hard protecting the cultural resources of their people. Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan has an interim tribal historic preservation officer and we work really hard. Shannon can tell you. We do. All right, and then we're, we, uh, do we have everybody? Oh yes, Giway Gizugukwe Martin from the Lakview Desire Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians as a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And she's also on the Tribal Council too. So she feels double duty. All right, so uh, that's all our Anishinaabe tribes that uh, have a Tribal Historic Preservation Office. But I'm gonna give you an idea of what we do so in cooperation with federal and state agencies, local governments, and private organizations and individuals, the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices direct and conduct comprehensive tribal lands, wide surveys of historic properties, and they maintain inventories of such properties. And many years ago, Mr. Wesley Andrews from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, do we have any Little Traverse in the house. Oh, one. 
couple anyway. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Wesley Andrews from Little Traverse Bay Bands of Adao Indians assisted the Saginaw Chippewa with putting that survey together of our historic properties, and we're always most uh, indebted to him for all his hard work on our behalf. One of the things that we do is we identify and nominate eligible properties to the National Register and otherwise administer applications for listing historic properties on the National Register. And guess what? The Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Yep, somebody said yep, yep. And we received that distinction on February the 28th of this year. So we're doing good. Uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices prepare and implement comprehensive tribal lands wide historic preservation plans. Uh oh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so Saginaw Chippewas are still, you know, working on it. You know, to have a beautiful historic preservation plan so that uh, we're, we're protecting things in perpetuity for the future. So it's a lot of hard work. One of the things that we do is administer the tribal program of federal assistance for historic preservation and carrying out our historic preservation responsibilities. And uh, Shannon Martin, uh, our z -Point Center director, uh, is, is the grant administrator. So she's always cracking the whip on us. And uh, we have a, a, a work plan to uh, submit uh, coming up here uh, at the end of June. Yeah, we're in June. All right. One of the things that we do is we advise and assist federal and state agencies and local governments in carrying out their historic preservation responsibilities. And we've done that time and time again, especially in downtown Flint, Michigan. For those of us that may remember the Flint Stone Street Ancestral Recovery and Reburial Project, that was all about Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and putting 120 ancestors back to rest because they were disturbed by a construction project that went south. And it took us three field seasons to do that. And Dr. Beverly A. Smith from the University of Michigan Flint uh, assisted us as the principal investigator. So uh, we're most indebted uh, to Dr. Bev. So we're thinking about her today. We cooperate with the Secretary, the Secretary of Interior, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and other federal and state agencies, local governments, and organizations and individuals to ensure that historic properties are taken into consideration at all levels of planning and development. And that's what we're doing right here at the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School. So it's a lot of hard work. We provide public information, education, and training, and technical assistance in historic preservation. And once again, we do that time and time again. We've, we've had uh, Section 106 basic training and advanced training and writing uh, uh, agreement documents training. And we make that available to the, all the tribal community who are concerned with historic preservation matters. We consult with federal agencies in accordance with the National Historic Preservation Act regarding federal undertakings that may affect our historic properties. And we cooperate with local governments in developing local historic preservation programs. And uh, as everybody knows, we're working side by side with the city of Mount Pleasant as they uh, uh, begin to develop their portions of the uh, Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School District and uh, we're continuing to work with them and we're going to continue to get that work done and those are the types of things that we do on behalf of our people uh, so please give us a give us a round of applause that's a lot of hard work and all your support means a lot to us Doing good. One of the things that I wanted to talk about today was the Governor's Award. I heard about the Governor's Award. 
It was the 2015 Governor's Award for Historic Preservation. And on Wednesday, May the 6th of 2015, State of Michigan Governor Rick Snyder and Michigan State Historic Preservation Officer Brian D. Conway recognized the Michigan Department of Transportation, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians, the Machi Benishawish Band of Potawatomi, the Gun Lake Tribe, the Nottawasepi Huron Band of the Potawatomi, and Commonwealth Cultural Resources Group Incorporated with the 2015 Governor's Award for Historic Preservation for the US 31, M231, Holland to Grand Haven Archaeological Data Recoveries. I'm going to tell you a little about that project. Investigations of three archaeological sites that were determined to be eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places were undertaken by the Michigan Department of Transportation in 2011 and 2012. The excavations in consultation with the federally recognized Indian tribes of Michigan were required by Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act in advance of the construction of a bridge over the Grand River for the new State Route M231. The tribes worked cooperatively with the Michigan Department of Transportation and Commonwealth Cultural Resources Group, Incorporated, to investigate the three archaeological sites dating to the late woodland period, which is AD 1000 to AD 1500, and the development of a tribal involvement plan. And the road officially opened to traffic on Friday, October the 30th of 2015, M231 is seven miles long, and it connects M45 in Robinson Township to M104, I-96 in Crockery Township. And the two-lane route provides a much-needed additional crossing of the Grand River, and it alleviates congestion in Ottawa County, consistently one of the fastest-growing counties in Michigan. Whew. How do you like that? So we're going to continue with that same project. We received the 2016 Michigan Historic Preservation Network Award. So on Friday, everybody received um, a Historic Preservation Network Award, all those same people. We won't go through that big list again. And the award was given for their contribution to historic preservation in Michigan and in recognition of the M231, US 31, Holland to Grab, uh, Grand Haven Archaeological Data Recoveries. How do you like that? You're supposed to say, yeah, that's cool. Ooh. That is cool. It's the preservation of a late woodland site. And what was so important uh, about that site is it's a site of our ancestors. Pretty cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit more about that because there's a 2017 segment to it. But we're in 2018, right? All right. And this is where Sydney's going to get real proud. Where's Sydney Martin? Where is she at? There she is. And this is where we make Sydney Martin of the Machi Benishawish Band of Potawatomi, the Gun Lake Tribe, real, real proud. The foundation for a new set of lesson plans to teach third and fifth graders about Michigan archaeology and the state's Native American past, it comes from an unexpected place under a bridge. Information from two archaeological sites excavated by the Michigan Department of Transportation in 2011 and 2012 in advance of the construction of the M230 bridge over the Grand River was used to develop new lesson plans. The Ottawa County excavations showed evidence of several occupations dating primarily between 800 and 350 years ago. Artifacts including pottery shards and stone tools, along with food remains, were recovered. These excavations provide evidence that the sites were used for harvesting wild rice and fishing for Lake Sturgeon, and the work earned everybody 
a Governor's Award for Historic Preservation in 2015. <coughs> All right. The archaeological sites are brought to life by interpreting them through the cultural, historical, environmental, and indigenous knowledge of the Anishinaabek people, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, also known as the Three Fires, whose ancestors created the sites. The lesson plans address misconceptions, stereotypes, and preconceived notions about Native American history and culture that character characterize many of the materials currently available to teachers. And so our old friend, uh, where's Sydney again? There she is over there. Her, Sydney's old friend, she loves Dr. James Robertson. This is what he said. It's the story of the Anishinaabek people that we're learning about in doing the excavations of these sites. This whole complex of things is related to what we know prehistorically, historically, and today about how the Native American tribes of Michigan look at wild rice and lake sturgeon from a cultural, economic, and a spiritual viewpoint. So it is an opportunity to learn and better understand the heritage of Michigan's native people. So now here comes the cool part. And the cool part is all the third and fifth graders in the state of Michigan, in the public school system, will be learning about our ancestors firsthand from the Anishinaabek people. Spine tingling. I have to say. All right. Let me just make sure I'm, I'm in order. In 2016, we won the Governor's Award for Historic Pre uh, Preservation and a State of Michigan special tribute. So on Tuesday, May the 3rd of 2016, State of Michigan Governor Rick Snyder and Michigan State Historic Preservation Officer Brian D. Conway recognized the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, Central Michigan University, and the City of Mount Pleasant with the 2016 Governor's Award for Historic Preservation. And this award was given for documenting the history of the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School through an ongoing program of archeological research and outreach initiatives that promotes healing and understanding of the lives of boarding school students. And before we go any further, is Dr. Sarah Surface Evans around? She's to my right, here she comes. So Dr. Sarah Surface Evans uh, was our principal investigator, everybody. And she's the reason, she's the reason why we won that beautiful award. 2016 Governor's Award for Historic Preservation. And the state of Michigan's legislature, the state government, and community honored the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, Central Michigan University, and the city of Mount Pleasant with a special tribute for the work accomplished by all those involved in the preservation of the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School. Kevin Cotter, the Speaker of the House, 99th District, and Judy K. Emmons, State Senator, 33rd District, presented the award. There we go. <laughs> We're getting closer to nowadays. All right, Michigan State Historic Preservation Review Board approved the nomination of the former Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School to the National uh, Register of Historic Places. And this is pretty impressive stuff, so I wanted you to be reminded of this. We talked about this last year. 
The Michigan State Historic Preservation Review Board approved the nomination of the former Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School to the National Register of Historic Places at its meeting in Lansing, Michigan on Friday, January the 13th of 2017. The nominated property encompassed extant former school buildings, the grounds associated with them, and the Mission Creek Cemetery, including agriculture and woodland areas that historically formed parts of the school campus. Uh, Robert O. Christensen, he was the National Register Coordinator uh, at the Michigan State uh, Historic Preservation Office. He presented the nomination on behalf of the, uh, uh, the tribes and, and the CMU and the city, and he presented that to the Michigan State Historic Preservation Review Board, and this is what he said. The speakers from the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan showcase the importance and meaning of the school to all the Michigan tribes and made a strong impression on the SHPO staff that I spoke to. It's one thing to know about the history as a historian and understand that our history is not all positive, but quite another and far more valuable and instructive but to be presented with living history, spoken in a language that would have been forbidden at the school, by exhibiting clothes that would have been forbidden, and hearing from descendants of those who lived the history and what it meant to them was truly impactful. One of my favorite parts about uh, this, this whole uh, approval process, and um, Robert, Robert said that he um, presented 1,700 nominations to the National or to the uh, uh, Preservation Review Board. And of the 1,700 that he did, ours was the best. How do you like that? We love it. So one thing that I want to hear, uh, Mr. Christensen had been with the Michigan State Historic Preservation Office for over 38 years and has seen over 1,700 nominations come through the office and he mentioned this was an unforgettable part of my long experience with the State Historic Preservation Office and with the Review Board. The National Register designation will help to mark the history and help in identifying this as one of the places across the country where similar history took place. And uh, our old friend is retired now, but he went out with a bang. All right. Can, can you put up with me for a little more? Just a little? Okay. So um, our tribal chief um, talked about the, uh, the uh, Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School uh, making it to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, one of the things that um, we have uh, in front here, in front here, is a draft of the actual plaque that will be um, on display here at the boarding school grounds. But one of the things that um, we're hopeful for is community input because your family members went to the school as well as ours and we're asking for your input so anything that you uh, may wish to include in the plaque please write it on a, a little sticky note and make sure that we get it and then we'll attempt to uh, honor everyone's input what do you think we're all in this together as a tribal community all right so the last thing that I want to say before I leave is the work continues and we have some wonderful people working really hard on our behalf in the Office of Grants and Contracts, the Saginaw Chippewa's Office of Grants and Contracts. Lisa Tiger is right over here. Come on Lisa, show everybody. There she is. She's working really hard. She's writing grants on our behalf. And uh, recently we submitted a, a, uh, a grant application 
to the U.S. Department of the Interior, the National Park Service's Tribal Historic Preservation Program. And uh, uh, Lisa is doing this on behalf of our Thippo office, uh, which, um, which is always most welcome. Any help. <laughs> and and, um, and so she submitted this uh, grant in the amount of $48,312.25. Yeah. But as I was coming into the Zeebling Center yesterday, um, uh, the National Park Service has been in contact with Shannon Martin, our director at the Zeebling Center, and they're going to see about if we amend the, the grant application a little in regard to our goals and objectives. They're going to increase it to $60,000. Yeah, give me that. And then we're going to do our best to preserve uh, the buildings that, uh, for those of us that went on the tour, you can see a little bit of vandalism. And, you know, people personally don't care about the building like we do. And so that money is going to be used to fit in the, in the buildings. And, and we're going to do a feasibility survey uh, of the, all the tribal community on, on how you see, you know, the use of the land in the buildings. Sound good? Sound good. So the, the two buildings that will uh, get the protective fence are our, our auditorium and chapel and the gymnasium. And those buildings are the ones that are de deemed uh, most viable for rehabilitation uh, for for uh, preservation in perpetuity. So we thank you everybody for all your attention uh, while I've been up here. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Eric Rodriguez. And uh, we have another keynote speaker. Well, uh, one more big hand for William Johnson here, reporting all those fantastic things that our Thipple officers are doing, both for the Saginaw Chippewa Tribe and throughout the state. All right. Just as a reminder, here as we're approaching the, the closure of our silent auction, 3.30 is the deadline, so uh, we do have a little bit of time after our next keynote address, but if you have an opportunity here and you want to make sure you're winning your item, head on over to our silent auction tents and make sure you get your last-minute bids in. We'll do a countdown to assure you how much time you have. Also, yes, thank you, Consuelo, for reminding me of that. Also have 50-50 sales still going on. Those will close also this afternoon, so get your 50-50 tickets from either Cheryl or Consuelo selling out there in the audience today. Over $600? Over $600 so far, Rays. Thank you to all of you for supporting our HHR event, and somebody's going to go home very happy today. But next, I would like to introduce our next keynote speaker. We have Kay Sanina Lomoema. Uh, from the Muskogee Creek Nation, not enrolled, but joined Arizona State University in January 2014. From 1994 to 2014, she served on the faculty of American Indian Studies at the University of Arizona, serving as head from 2005 to 2009. From 1988 to 1994, she was a member of the Anthropology and American Indian Studies faculty at the University of Washington. She is the recipient of numerous teaching honors, including the University of Washington's Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Lomoima's teaching interests include U.S. history, American Indian policy history, indigenous knowledge systems, and research issues in American Indian education. Her research interests include the status of Native people as U.S. citizens and Native nations as indigenous sovereigns, the role of Native nations in shaping U.S. federalism, and the history of American Indian School. Research on the federal off-reservation boarding school system is rooted in the experiences of her father, Curtis Thorpe Carr, a survivor of Chilaco Indian Agricultural School in Oklahoma, where he was enrolled from 1927 to 1935. Many of her books have garnered national recognition, including To Remain an Indian, Outstanding Book Award, American Educational Research Association, and they called it Prairie Light, the Story of Chilaco Indian School, received the North American Indian Prose Award, American uh, Educational As Association Critics' Choice Award. Lomoima served as 2012-2013 president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, which helped found in 2007 
and, in, and as 2005 president of the American Society of Ethnohistory, she was awarded the Western History Association Lifetime Achievement Award for American Indian History in 2010. In 2016, she was selected a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and elected to the National Academy of Education. Help me in welcoming Dr. Sanina Lamoy. Thank you all. Can you hear me out yeah. there in the back? Wave if you can hear me. Thank you. I also want to say thank you, Mado, to Willie Johnson, to the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, um, to everyone here today for being able to join you on this just amazingly beautiful day at this tremendously important historic site on the past, present, and future homelands of the Saginaw Chippewa tribe. It's a very great honor to be with you today. And I'm here with you today um, as a historian of these Indian boarding schools, but perhaps more importantly, um, as the daughter of uh, an Indian school survivor. So because my work as a historian is really, um, as Eric said, is rooted in my dad's stories about the school where he grew up. And so what I want to do today is actually to focus on stories rather than on facts, figures, dates. Um, although being a historian, I'm sure a few of those will creep in along the way. Um, but I'm going to start today um, with a story that my dad told me. So one day as a kid, my dad announced, out of the blue, he said, squirrels love hard candy. And as a kid, I'm like, squirrels? Um, and he told me this story from his childhood at Shalako Indian Agricultural School. Um, hopefully you can see this picture of uh, the original building at Shalako, and if you can't, all you have to do is look that way. Um, thank you to the Federal Obsession with Homogenizing Indian Country because that building looks very much like that building. And if you look at that building, right wing, first row of windows, left hand window, that's precisely the room that my dad and brother would have entered in the boys' dorm, home too at Shalako when they arrived. At Shalako in the spring, boys would climb up into shaggy nests of leaves swaying at the tops of the tallest trees. And they would capture baby squirrels for pets. And in Oklahoma, you occasionally see black squirrels. I don't know if that's true in Michigan. But black squirrels. Charlie were among the squirrel elite at Shalako because they knew where the black squirrels were. had black squirrels. And that made them very special. And then you have grown up at a federal school like this, very rarely, if ever, heard those words. Because after all, these schools were designed to tell Indian children how not special they were. They were, of every day, of every week, of every year, spent away from family and home. In case you're wondering, the candy that squirrels like, all day suckers, like an old-fashioned kind of lollipop, hard and shiny as glass. My dad said, the squirrel curled up in my shirt pocket during the day and slept. Every so often, the squirrel would poke his head up out of the shirt pocket and demand a broken up piece of all day sucker. I wonder how that felt. A warm young squirrel curled up in the pocket over his heart. Dad said, squirrels are wild animals after all, you can't really tame them come, then the squirrel would be ready to leave. And the boys would always let them go. And back they would go to those tall trees along Shalako Creek in the Catalpa Grove. And I wonder, was that part of the appeal? To be a temporary squirrel holder for a few weeks out of the long year and to see the squirrel go free?
squirrels, my dad told me, love hard candy. And my dad loved candy too, especially chocolate-covered cherries. And I wonder, growing up in that kind of institution, when did he first taste a chocolate-covered cherry? And you may think a question about chocolate-covered cherries is a pretty odd place to start a talk about federal Indian boarding schools. But it's a question that rises up out of my dad's stories and how lately I've begun to think and feel about them um, and the hard questions that those stories raise. How do we remember? How do we do honor? How might we accomplish something uh, like healing? And the stories, I believe, are key to those processes. In the 1920s in Wichita, Kansas, a judge decided that my grandmother, Cora Wanima Carr, who was Muscogee or Creek, um, was an incompetent parent. I mean, she was, after all, native, and she was raising three children uh, without a husband uh, who had abandoned the family. So as a consequence, my dad was about um, eight, going on nine years old, uh, when that judge in Wichita sent him and his older brother, Bob, to Shilako, this off-reservation federal Indian boarding school in northern Oklahoma. And my dad then did not see his mother again until he was 14 or 15 years old, uh, when he went, as they say, AWOL, absent without leave, he ran away uh, from Shilako because he wanted to see his mother. Shilako was built in 1884, a few years before Mount Pleasant, um, when scientific opinion and popular opinion were uh, united in endorsing racial hierarchy and white supremacy. And the US was doing its best to erase indigenous sovereignty and indigeneity itself by criminalizing native religions, native languages, native cultures, economy, social life, pretty much the whole ballgame. Um, Shilako, of course, and Mount Pleasant were products of the same federal system. So the two schools um, share a number of characteristics. Um, although there were some important differences between those two schools as well. Um, as I mentioned, Shilako was built in 1884. Mount Pleasant opened in 1893. Uh, Mount Pleasant, as I'm sure you all know, was built according to terms outlined in the 1855 treaty. And it enrolled mostly Anishinaabe students, about 300 students a year. Um, Shilako was built originally to enroll students from, at that time, the very recently hostile Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, and Comanche tribes, although that enrollment expanded quite um, rapidly to include about 45 different tribes from um, Oklahoma, but across uh, the western um, United States as well. And at its height in the Depression, enrollment at Shilako reached um, in the vicinity of 1,000 to 1,200 students per year. Um, after World War II, Shilako also enrolled many Diné or Navajo students. And then in the 50s and 60s, they enrolled a lot of native Alaskan students. So students were brought all the way to northern Oklahoma from their homes in Alaska. Uh, Mount Pleasant closed as an Indian school in 1934. Shilako remained open until 1980. And both campuses now are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, although that designation is no protection against the heavy hand of time, as you've heard today. So community support is going to be crucial um, to keep this campus in better shape than I'll tell you Shilako's in now, which is deteriorating rapidly. Now, I made a note on this slide, I hope this is still the Shilako slide, about the Browning ruling, um, just to remind us of this really important fact that federal powers that the feds have asserted over Indian people have largely been imposed by bureaucrats, employees of the office, later the Bureau of Indian Affairs, not necessarily always by laws. And that means bureaucratic regulations are not reviewable by the courts. There's no appeal to the courts. They have quite literally operated outside the law. So my dad's case was actually unusual in this regard, being placed in an Indian school by court order. Most Indian children um, taken from their families to boarding schools were actually taken by virtue of bureaucratic orders or regulations like the Browning Rule. 
however, who resisted were subject to incarceration and other serious punishments. Well, like I said, questions rise up when we think about Indian boarding schools and Indian children and Indian nations. And back in 1984, when I started to interview my dad and about 60 other alumni from Shilako, the first question that I asked was not, Dad, when did you first taste a chocolate-covered cherry? <laughs> um, you know, I had gr grown up um, with my dad's stories of his childhood, right, as many children do. And like many children, I thought our family was normal. Maybe some of you share that delusion <laughs> about your families. I believe my dad was brilliant and loving and handsome, and he was all of those things. But I was in my teens before I began to realize the impact on him of the institution in which he had been raised, not only on him, but on our family as well. And I um, was at least in my 20s before I began to realize that his older brother, Bob, had not survived. But honestly, the question about chocolate-covered cherries did not occur to me until September 28th, 4 a.m. last year, 2017, about a year ago, when I just woke up, bolt upright out of bed and began to think about my dad's stories in ways that I just had not thought about them before. So fall 1984 to fall 2017, that's 33 years. Yeah. About five and a half years after my dad had passed away. Haven't played all year. <laughs> what took me so long, you might well ask? A failure of imagination, perhaps, or perhaps a failure of courage? Yeah. Uh, because these stories can be tough. Indian boarding school stories are inspiring frequently funny, nearly always heartbreaking. Stories can ignite raucous laughter. They can spur tears. Stories are quiet, reserved, kept to oneself. Stories are never ever told. Stories nestle in a pocket over our heart until the day they poke their head out and demand a piece of all day sucker. Feed me. Remember me. Listen to me. Tell me. And then the questions rise up. How do we listen? How do we remember? How do we honor? And so today I invite you to think about stories and also to think about some images beginning with these really famous so-called before and after images taken by John Choate at Carlisle Indian School. So as my father's daughter, you might say, um, I've thought about Indian boarding schools all my life, but I didn't begin to actually study them until 1984. And since then, I've been amazed by this huge um, and amazing photographic archive that the federal government intentionally put together and used to document um, the school's everything. Architecture, discipline, classrooms, dining halls, fields, the whole, the whole ballgame. And so these photographs were produced as part of a really massive public relations campaign that was designed to convince the public, I don't know, maybe the feds themselves, that they were doing this really great work to transform native children from savages to civilized, to maybe, possibly, become citizens of the nation that had divested native nations of their land and their prosperity and even their children. So that campaign advertised, right? It was a PR campaign. It advertised the benevolent paternalism of a caring federal guardian for its suffering wards. Where did that idea come from? Federal guardian and Indian ward. This man is responsible. First Justice of the US Supreme Court, John Marshall, who remarked in this 1831 case that the relationship between Indians and the feds resembled, not was, but kind of sort of maybe looked like the relationship between a guardian and a ward. And that relationship, that resemblance was so incredibly convenient, it immediately became entrenched as dogma in federal Indian law. 
And these before and after photographs were staple images in the arsenal of weapons that advertised Indian wards as savages who were going to benefit from federal guardianship. And so these photographs were widely, widely reproduced in their day and still are, as a matter of fact. And the most uh, famous pair, I think, that has been reproduced the most by my scholarly count about a billion times are the before and after photographs of Tom Torlino, a student, Navajo student. Um, I mean, they're compelling images. And you see them in documentary films, on web websites, uh, museum exhibits, book covers. Um, Google it. Tom Torlino, before and after. They're everywhere. And I believe some people might have believed their message, that the boarding schools worked magic, and Tom Torlino was transformed. But it wasn't true. I mean, it was a really effective public relations message, though. However, however much power these schools held over Indian children, we know that Indian children had powers and strengths of their own. Tom Torlino came to Carlisle Indian School as a young Diné man. And when he returned home, he was still Diné. And the Gallup Independent, a newspaper um, in New Mexico, interviewed his son in the 19s, early 70s, I think. And this is what his son, Francis, had to say about Tom Torlino. He could put on a suit when he needed to, but he was just as comfortable in traditional Navajo clothing. When he returned to his home in Coyote Canyon, he picked up his career as a rancher and medicine man right where he had left off. So Torlino's life after Carlisle put the lie to that American mythology that total transformation of Indian people that the schools supposedly affected. And in thinking again about the Torlino photographs and other before and after photographs, I came to realize that our family archive also held a pair of before and after photographs. And these two photographs put a lie to the other myth, to the myth of the government as a benevolent guardian of suffering wards. So only three photographs exist of my dad as a child. You're going to see two of them. Um, the first photograph was taken in Wichita, Kansas, I think about 1926. Um, the tall girl to the left may have been a neighbor's child. Honestly, my dad could never remember who she was. Then in the middle, there's his brother Bob, Robert, uh, cradling the cheeks of their younger sister Betty. And then my dad, Kurt, to the right. Um, my dad always thought that Betty had grown up with their mom, um, but actually in 1984 he learned that um, Betty had been deemed too young for Shilako, so she'd been placed in the Wichita Orphanage. Uh, my grandma worked as a laundress in the Wichita Orphanage, so it's possible she and Betty got to see one another. Anyway, I've come to think of this as the before photo in my dad's boarding school story. So we see three clean, well cared for children dressed in their Sunday best for some special occasion. Um, the boys are scowling slightly, squinting against the sun, maybe upset as boys might be to be in those clean white shirts and ties and with their hair slicked back. Um, the after photo shows a very dramatically different image. Uh, it's Saturday morning at Shilako. This is one of the few times when boys had free time to run outdoors, hunt along Shilako Creek, try to escape the surveillance of school staff. Um, so a couple from Wichita, friends of my grandmother's, had traveled down to Oklahoma and they promised my grandma they would stop by Shilako and try to take a picture of her boys. Um, Bob was nowhere to be found, but they managed to track down Kurt somehow. Um, and this is no government produced PR photograph. Um, Kurt is dirty, ragged, and barefoot, and 30 years of doing the history of these schools, I have seen very, very few photographs that show this. The uncomplimentary, unvarnished truth about how the federal guardian cared for its so-called wards. Now, you might recall a few minutes ago I said that many questions rise up when we start thinking about boarding schools. And if we want to understand why these schools came to be the way they were, um, we need to ask a really big question. I think this is possibly the biggest question of all, which is, 
What does it mean that the United States of America is built on Indian land? Every square inch that undergirds U.S. sovereignty, U.S. identity, U.S. prosperity is native land. And for a huge chunk of that real estate, there was not a clean transfer of title. That's judging by U.S. moral and legal standards, not by indigenous standards. By U.S. standards, we do not have a clean transfer of title. And that, I think, is the root of what the U.S. has long called the Indian problem. Being the problem that Native people have quite stubbornly refused to disappear, refused to fade into the sunset where American mythology hopes to relegate us. And so Indian people, I think, in a very fundamental way for a lot of our nation's history have been perceived as a threat. And so there's been a system of containment designed to contain the threat. Threats like criminals, infectious diseases, so-called deviants, more recently terrorists. Military power is used to confine people to spaces. It might be reservations, it might be institutions like boarding schools under bureaucratic control, not subject to review of the courts. So reservations as well as boarding schools were established as sites of total rehabilitation to erase and replace. Erase and replace language, erase and replace religion, erase and replace economy, art, architecture, clothing, hairstyle. That dedication to erasing Indianness has been called a logic of elimination. And the logic of elimination works to justify the existence of the U.S. and to justify U.S. claims to its territorial base, to all that's Indian land. And that's why boarding schools were created, to erase Indianness from the landscape that the U.S. claims is its own. However, my dad's stories and the stories of all those survivors powerfully remind us that the logic of elimination has not been successful. Damage has been done. I mean, there's no question about that, and damage continues to be done. But Indians and Indianness to this day have not been erased from the landscape, and those stories teach us that. Shalako did a lot of damage, but it also became home to hundreds, in fact, thousands of Native children. Smart and resourceful and resilient and dedicated to one another and so much more than just victims. And their stories, stories of friendship and laughter, even happiness, carved out of that institutional life demand our attention and our honor and our respect. And this last story stands out in my memory as deeply illuminating about Shalako student life. I call this the Night of the Japanese Lanterns. So that's a boy's dormitory. We have to think about the boys at Shilako. The boy's life at Shilako was ruled by the disciplinarians. So he would, these were the men, the employees who were charged with the surveillance and control of a little over 400 Indian boys, teenagers, and young men, you know, up through their 20s. And there's not very many staff. So that need for control rationalized this military system of discipline, um, sorting students into military companies by rank and age, housing them in numbered dormitories. In that respect, Shilako really embodied the school as prison. And the matrons, as well as the disciplinarians, were in the guard towers, quite literally. The disciplinarian the boys called the Black Panther stopped them. He would climb that water tower every Saturday morning with a pair of binoculars to spy on the boys in their few free hours. And this story, frankly, is not about the Black Panther, but when that movie came out this year, I just couldn't resist throwing this in here because I just cracked up, you know, all this advertisement about the Black Panther. This is my image of the Black Panther, Harry S. Keller. This story is actually about a man the boys call Hippo. He's rather a large man. <laughs> so, in addition to the students being captive on these campuses, the employees were also required to live on campus. 
and the married employees lived in, in um, small cottages. And Hippo and his wife um, lived in one of these cottages, and one uh, warm Saturday evening, Hippo and his wife hosted a garden party. So you can imagine the scene. There's picnic tables piled high with food, Japanese lanterns strung across tree branches. It was Saturday night. So that means the boys had had all day to plan just an elaborate and ongoing flouting of authority that in Shalako slang, students call tricksing. Pranks, practical jokes, sabotage. Shalako was an agricultural school, over 8,000 acres. Um, and that generated needed revenue. Congressional appropriations were never enough to run the school. So there's a large cattle herd, turkey and chicken flocks, fruit orchards, pasture, grain fields. Um, and the boys plowed those grain fields behind teams of mules and uh, draft horses. It didn't come up. Ah, my clickers are on dead. <laughs> Would you mind advancing it? There should be teams of horses and mules there. Hooray! Um, so Shalako, of course, is also a federal facility. Um, so they received also supplies, cast off uniforms, hardtack rations, um, and the like from the US military. And um, in about 1928, maybe 1929, the cavalry, the US cavalry, had retired um, some battle-trained cavalry horses to the Shalako horse herd. The boys seized the opportunity. It was Saturday night. Would you mind advancing? Thank you. My dad's gang of mixed blood, Creek, and Cherokee troublemakers slipped out the dorm window of home two and snuck over to the barn. The boys all loved to ride. Um, but those mules and draft horses were not much fun. Strong, fast cavalry horses, that was a mighty temptation. <coughs> they didn't need saddles, they didn't need bridles, they took a halter rope, looped it around the horse's jaws, and they were off. The horses were just as enthusiastic as the boys, and they rocketed down the loop road that circled around Shalako's small lake. At the corner where the employee cottages clustered, the road dog-legged to the left, but the horses did not. These were cavalry horses. They were trained to charge into battle. The cavalry charges straight ahead, ragged, barefoot Indian boys hanging on for dear life. Right through Hippo's garden party. And those strong, fast cavalry horses launched themselves over the picnic tables. Disciplinarians, matrons, teachers scattering like chickens. At this point in the story, my dad would yell, It was the charge of the light brigade! <laughs> I cherish that image. My dad and his gang brothers. Ragged, unloved, fierce Indian boys sailing across the night sky, looking down at astonished, upturned faces as those strong, fast cavalry horses vaulted over the picnic tables and pounded away into the night. Strings of gently lit Japanese lanterns streaming from their shoulders. <laughs> Not exactly the stereotypical image of Indian warriors on horseback, but warriors nonetheless. And I wonder, what did that feel like? Did it feel like freedom? Two clicks on this one. Both photos up? My dad was brilliant and loving and darn handsome. He was full of fun and laughter and jokes. <clears throat> and he also always carried great anger towards his mom, feeling that she had abandoned them. When I asked him in 1983, Dad, what would you think about me trying to do an oral history of Shalako Indian School? He first said, that's a great idea. And then a little bit later he said, be prepared to hear some hard stories. 
and I can give no better advice to anyone interested in Indian boarding schools. These are important stories. And I believe my dad's stories that I shared with you today are at their heart about a commitment to freedom. The freedom to be Muskogee, the freedom to be Anishinaabe, the freedom to be a native person on native terms. And they are also at their heart about a defiance of the logic of elimination. And I thank you all for your attention. Very moving and powerful. A big round of applause for our keynote speaker today, Cesaria Romoema. I think we're all touched by her words today and uh, everything that uh, she can share. And uh, we actually have a, a special gift, uh, courtesy of a grant that we secured through our tribal libraries. The Institute of Museum and Library Services was able to acquire a grant. Uh, one for the, the keynote address today, but also for copies of, of a book. Um, and let me get a copy of that here. And this is the, the book they call it, The Prairie Light. And I'm looking for representatives for three tribes here to take a, co a copy back to their respective tribal libraries. So if I could have a representative from the Nottawasepi Huron Band of Potawatomi, please join me on stage to receive a copy. Also the Manchi Benicia Wish Band of Potawatomi, the Gun Lake Tribe, and also the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi. If we have a representative from their council or another representative that would like to come up and receive a copy of the book, it would be much appreciated to bring back to their communities. And she has also offered to sign them for us as a token of appreciation here for presenting on that today. Now also, while we have those three come here and get those back to their Everyone that had an opportunity filled out the slip to receive. We have 14 copies. Take them away so we'll draw some names. So looking for a representative from the Nyoseppe Huron Band and Pokagan Band. Anybody here from the Polkagan band that could take one back for us? There we go. Judy? Yeah. Alright, so we have 14 copies here to give away today. And I'm going to have Catuelo join, join me and draw some names. Alright, first name we have. A Daniel Dick from Pokehagen. Daniel's here, yes. All right. Congratulations. Tamara Green from Ottawa. Colin R. Wiesaw from the Potawatomi. Jennifer Wethington from the uh, Nottawasebi Huron Band of Potawatomi. 